Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to another Wednesday. And it is a, a beautiful, hot, scorching, hazy, hot, humid, Washington, D.C., DMV type of day. Whew. Good evening, Fred. Uh, good evening, good evening, everybody, as you're logging in on tonight. Good to see everybody. Uh, for this evening's uh, Wednesday night Bible study, uh, Rita and Shirley and all the others that are logging on, good to see you, good to see you. Um, this evening, uh, we are going to look at 1 John chapter 5, which is the final chapter of uh, 1 John, and we'll uh, cover that and close out 1 John for uh, this well, actually, for the month. And as uh, I'm sure many of you have realized, today is the final day of June, and we get ready to move into July. So hello, everybody, Robin and Andrea and Sandy and all the others that are logging on there. Good to see everybody. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So um, this evening, as I said, we'll be looking at First John chapter 5 uh, and just digging in there. And uh, closing out this incredible, incredible, incredible um, epistle, letter about um, fellowship, the joy of fellowship, um, as we've been looking at it throughout this last five weeks. So hopefully everybody is there in First John chapter 5 and probably maybe some of the more, more popular of a chapter, some maybe for some, maybe not for others, but... Anyway, um, let's get ourselves all ready, pray, and get started, see how the Lord leads us on tonight. Hopefully, you guys will pray along with us, not only for those that are tuning in now, but those who will tune in later uh, for the uh, Friday night chat. And don't forget, uh, we will have no, no, no Wednesday night Bible studies throughout the month of July. Just got too many things going on throughout that month, and it'll be just too interrupted. So, um yeah, so no, no Friday, no, I'm sorry, no Wednesday Bible study, no Wednesday night Bible study during the month of July. I do believe uh, they will be continuing the noonday uh, Bible study during the month of July, but no evening Bible study for the month of July. So we'll have a break in July, come back in August and hit uh, Second John. But we'll finish out First John for tonight. Um, also, just in case you're tuning in and, and you're a Friday night chat person, no Friday night chats in July. Uh, either. So we may have one that may come up uh, in July, but we'll let you know if that so happens. But nevertheless, First John chapter 5, and we'll dig right in. Father in heaven, we bless you on this evening. Thank you for your incredible grace that is keeping us in the midst of all kinds of chaos in the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing. We pray, eternal God, as we read your word tonight, that it will become alive in our lives and our hearts, that it will cause us even to rejoice in what we have in you, Heavenly Father. I pray, God, that tonight you would open up the eyes and ears and hearts of those who are listening. Uh, perhaps someone is just in need of the knowledge of assurance of their eternal security with you or salvation with you or just the fact of coming to know you. So, Lord, however it is that you desire to speak to people through our Bible study on tonight, I do pray that you would have your own way and that your will be accomplished in and through it. Lord, bless not only those listening now, but those that will tune in later to the broadcast uh, by whatever platform they may be watching it or viewing it on. We just pray your blessing and favor upon it. So uh, be with us on tonight. Lead us, guide us as we follow your word and try to open it up for the understanding of all tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. All right, here we go, here we go, here we go. Um, so First John has been... Uh, and just as a means of review, we know that this um, entire book uh, or letter, if you will, epistle, is has a three-word summary of joy of fellowship, joy of fellowship. So we started out chapter one, if we um, kind of laid out the outline of the book, chapter one actually uh, dealt with the basis of fellowship, and then chapters two through five deals with the behavior of fellowship. So we've been looking at the behavior of fellowship, especially for those that 
you know, those are who are in fellowship with God. We'll be able to identify who they are, um, how they should be behaving, what their behavior should look like for those that are in fellowship with the Lord. And so we've had uh, an, a tremendous journey of that. And then as well, last uh, week, we had a chance to kind of look into chapter four and see uh, how powerful and important um, love is to that uh, fellowship behavior. Uh, and, and he took us all the way back, literally, to the comparison of, of Jesus's uh, statements in uh, Matthew 27, I believe it is, where they, the Pharisees ask him uh, regarding uh, the greatest commandment. And he says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. And then he says the second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. Well, literally in chapter four, he's literally saying the same thing all over again. But he's saying, guess what? Um, if you want to want to determine the behavior, or you want to understand or know the behavior of one who has fellowship with God, it will be based on love. Uh, it'll be based on their love of God and their love of their brother. And in fact, he started out when we looked at it more in detail on Sunday as to how exactly we are going to try the spirits. Because he began chapter four by saying, hey, test the spirits or try the spirits, see if they be of God. And guess what? You can know whether the spirits that you're dealing with is of God based on the love that they have uh, for God and the love they have for one another. And ultimately, as we delve in here in chapter five, he's going to dig in even farther with this whole love issue and tell us, hey, this love has to do with obedience as well. Y'all still here with me? All right. So chapter five, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So again, we have to have this belief in our heart, okay, that Jesus is the Christ. Now, when we say he is the Christ, and I know some, and maybe, you know, maybe you uh, kind of misunderstood it for a long time, looked at when we call, you know, say, okay, um, Jesus Christ, we call him Jesus Christ. And so some think Jesus is his first name, Christ is his last name. Well, no, Jesus is his, is his name that was given, but Christ is his um, authoritative position. Um, Christ being the Messiah, the sent one, the one who uh, is the, uh, the, the provider of our salvation. He is the Christ. He, that's, that's his uh, redemptive title, if I can say it that way. So he is the Christ. So when we talk about here that um, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. That means he is the one that God sent. He is the one who redeemed us of all of our sin. He is the one who died, who was buried, who rose again. We, those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, those are the ones who are born of God. In other words, those are the ones who are born again of God. They're born again, okay, uh, of God. And everyone who loves him, who is or who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. So I, I love this too because it, it ties in a couple of things um, in terms of arguments that oftentimes people have. People have these arguments about um, separating Jesus from God and I, I, I love God but I don't believe in Jesus or I, I, I believe in God and I don't believe in Jesus and all that. Well, what this helps is I say you really can't love the one without loving the other. You can't Say, I love God, but I don't love Jesus. I'm, I'm not into that Jesus thing. No, it's, it's kind of a joint package, if you will, uh, because he says, look, everyone who loves him who begot, and God is the one who begot, he begot his son, and his son is the one who was begotten, okay? Uh, he is the only begotten of the Father. That's Jesus the Christ, who is the only begotten. And when we talk about begotten, it's, it's one who... Uh, literally comes from, of the seed of, or of the person of. So he is the begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ. So whoever, um, he says, everyone who loves him who begot, that is everyone who loves God, also loves him who is begotten of him, okay? So not only, watch this, not only do we love Christ, that is begotten, the only begotten of the Father, but also we love him, that is our brothers and sisters, because we are begotten also of the son, because we came into this relationship as sons and daughters of God. We were begotten of God through Jesus Christ. Y'all still here? And so you, you, that's why you can't just say, I love God, don't love my brother. That's why you can't say, I love God, but I don't love Jesus. So if you love God, you love 
the Father and you love the Son and you have to love all the brethren and sistren as well. So we're all one family because guess what? We all together are one. By this we know that we love the children of God. How do we know that we love the children of God? It's right here in the text. It says, when we love God and keep his commandments. So ultimately, we know that we love the children of God when we, and it's again another test. It's a testing of those who are in the fellowship, who are part of the, are experiencing the joy of fellowship uh, and knowing who those are that are in the fellowship, kind of a dividing line. Uh, we know that we love the children of God when we, lo when we love God and keep his commandments. So when you love God, you love the children of God. Because as you said, you have, if you love the, the one who begot, you got to love those that are begotten. And so we got to love the father. If you love the father, you love his children. And so you love the whole family. <laughs> um, so this is how we know it. And also rather that we keep his commandments. So we also have to keep the commandments of God uh, which is just another example of the fact that we are in the fellowship with God, that we are part of the family of God. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. So again, how do we know if we, if we have the love of God? Well, we know we have the love of God if we keep his commandments, because it, it's a manifestation of who we are a part of, who are we in fellowship with. We are in fellowship with the God who has redeemed us from sin, and so we love him, and so therefore we obey him or keep his commandments. So it kind of all falls in order. So for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, what John says is that keeping his word and keeping the things that he's laid out for us, they're not a burden. It's not, oh, Lord, I gotta do it. No, it's not. It's not burdensome for a couple of reasons. One is not burdensome because we love him. When you do something for someone you love, it's not a burden. It's a joy, okay? So it's a joy to, to keep the commandments of God. And if you, it's not burdensome, not only because, because we um, love him, but watch this, it's also not burdensome because we have his spirit in us to empower us to be able to keep his word. So watch this, his, his commandments are burdensome when we have to try to do it in and of our own strength, okay? Because in and of our own strength, it's hard to do. But when we are operating in the spiritual strength and the, the vitality that is provided by us by being children of God, having his spirit, then it's not a burden. So it's not burdensome for us to keep his commandments, okay? For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Wow, so every, everything that's born of God overcomes the world. And that is that we have now become part of the God who is the overcomer of this world, okay? So because he has overcome, we overcome with him. So everything that is of him or whoever is born of God, what, you know, is, or whatever, as it says here, is born of God, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What is it? Faith our faith, okay? It's our faith. Our, is, it is our faith that allowed us to overcome the world, okay? Earlier, we saw that um, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, and that's because he that is in us has overcome the world, and because we're in him, we also have overcome the world by our fellowship, by our connection to him. And so, um, everybody, again, born of God has overcome the world, this is the victory that we that he has overcome the world. And that victory came through faith. How do you and I become part of this family in the first place? It was through faith. It wasn't through our works or our deeds. It was by faith. It was through faith. So faith was the vehicle that got us into this family that allows us to overcome the world. Verse 5 says, Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So again, how do we know? This, this text is going to build so strongly on helping um, not only to identify who is in fellowship with God, but I'm going to say it's going to build so strongly a case for the one who doubts, who maybe doubts whether or not they have a security 
in their relationship with God? What is the level of security? How do I know for sure that I am a child of God? And he's laying that out, but he's continuing to build. So who is he who overcomes the world? I want to know, am I one of those who, who has overcome the world? Well, he says, but he who believes, he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. So my belief, again, my faith and my belief that Jesus is the son of God is a proof text. Okay, it's a um, and if I if I can use this word, um, it, it's it's a a proof point, a proving point. Uh, and this is ultimately the proof text, but it's a proving point that I've overcome the world, that I have life, I, that I have, you know, overcome the world. So the proof here is, do I believe that Jesus is the son of God? Earlier, one of my other my other proof points is it says whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? If I believe that, I'm born of God. That means I have an eternal relationship with him. And so as you keep building through this text, especially chapter 5, he builds very strongly to affirm and to identify those who are born again, those who are in the family of God, those who have fellowship with the Father. And so verse 5, whoever overcomes the world... Overcoming the world is to overcome the sin, okay? We've overcome the sin. We've overcome the, the, the judgment that is going to come on this world. We have overcome that, but we overcame it through our faith and our belief in the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, okay? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Now, um, when we look at this whole idea of coming by water and by blood, when I get into this next couple of verses, a whole lot of different viewpoints on this. There's some controversial passages in this um, chapter anyway, but there's there's a lot of, that goes on back and forth with this and and, and even more so in, on a, a one that later verse that's coming up. Um, but nevertheless, we talk about by the water and by the blood, the, the water being a, a mechanism of his baptism, the blood being the mechanism of his death. So his entrance into ministry through baptism his, his completion of his ministry through death or the shedding of his blood. One perspective of looking at it. Um, so this is he who came by water and blood. Okay? Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah came by water, through the baptism of water, came by blood. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of identifying this whole water and blood issue is water of the, the, um, uh, the amniotic fluid. Uh, in a sense that that a child is literally born of water they're in the fluids of their mom when they're being born of that water but also of the blood or blood um you know that they are connected to their parent or whatever so he's born of the water and the blood that's another perspective or way to actually look at it um and it is uh i'm sorry um this is who, who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth. Now, this is one of the reasons why the whole idea of baptism becomes more likely what the water and the blood are representative of is because at his baptism, the spirit gave testimony. God the Father gave testimony. The Spirit gave testimony that who he was, okay? Um, but nevertheless, it is, it is a, uh, a mechanism. So you got the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and so you've got testimony or witness given by the Spirit of God bears witness because the Spirit is truth. The, the Spirit of truth reveals that Jesus is the Christ, Okay? And, and that's how we understood that Jesus is the Christ. It was the spirit that revealed it to us. All right. So he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, by water, but by water and blood. So it wasn't just baptism, but it was baptism and death. Okay. It was his uh, substitutionary death uh, that, that, that um, he came. All right. And it is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is true. So the spirit bears witness that he actually literally came by water and by blood. 
For there are three that bear witness in heaven. That is the Father, the Word, and the Word is the Son. Okay? John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. That's, the, that's the, the Word and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So you have this marital union, if you will, of those that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Now, you will see these three bearing witness in heaven in Genesis chapter 1, where you see, in the beginning was the Word. Okay, I mean, I'm sorry. In the beginning, God, and He, you know, began, and it says, the Spirit hovered above the face of the... So the Spirit was present. The, the Father sp speaks, but what does the Father speak? He speaks Word, and the Word is what caused things to come into existence. And so you have those three who are present and in agreement, even in the very creation of the very world that we live in and the existence of what we see as human nature and animals and everything else. And so you, you have those three who bear witness together in heaven. Um, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, are one, are one. They are one. There's no dividing. There's no separate. They are one, okay? They manifest themselves differently, but they are one. It's not three different gods. It's one God, three manifestations, or three persons, okay? Three persons, one God. The Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God, um, ultimately fulfilling who God is. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And so if we utilize the spirit's presence, um, bearing witness on earth, uh, the water, in, in essence, the water baptism, when the, a word, the word comes from the spirit of God speaks, and uh, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. We have the uh, the witness there, and ultimately the blood that bears witness that he is a Christ because it is his blood that was that bore witness that his blood alone was rede had redeeming power. Uh, and as his blood was shed, redemption uh, was worked out on behalf of every believer or every unbeliever, everyone who would believe. And so the, the blood is what um, allows us to be, to, that, how can I say this? Uh, it is the blood that was shed that allows us to be reconciled with God because his blood was pure. Uh, it is the baptism of or his entrance into ministry that was given witness and testimony by the, the Lord speaking and uh, giving testimony of it. And so therein lies your, your witness on earth, okay, in that earthly scenario. Now, I will say, and I'll repeat again, the variety of different views and perspectives on how actually that plays out. Trust me, this isn't the tougher of the two that are argued by theologians much greater than myself. All right? So um, there's another one coming up um, again. So if we, I, I, I listen, I really love this part because, again, remember I said earlier that the passage of 1 John 5 gives affirmations, okay? A lot of times, you know, people get saved and they, you know, they kind of drift off or maybe they, they're they born again into the family of God, but their fellowship with God becomes a little sour and they drift off and maybe they're floating away. And then for some, they come into the body uh, as a believer. They confess their sins. They repent of their sins, place their faith in Jesus Christ. They become true believers, but they don't understand, you know, the whole concept of, you know, do I, am I still, am I, am I still saved or did I get saved? Or maybe somebody gave them a, a view or perspective on salvation. So they have questions. So a lot of times early on we have questions. Sometimes, depending on who you are, you may have questions for even longer, okay? Um, but what this passage will do is it gives us affirming points um, that we are part of the fellowship of God, that we are born again, that we can have some word to stand on as a testimony of our position and our fellowship with God so that I'll know that I'm born again, I don't have to doubt it. So I've got scripture and scripture and scripture. You know, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whoever loves him who is begotten, love. And on and on, it keeps getting, you keep getting these proof points, proof points, proof points. So it keeps on building. Now listen to this. When you get to, when you get to verse 9, 
I, I love the way John lays this out. He says, if we receive the witness of men, and we do, what do you mean by we receive the witness of men? We believe what men say. We do. We, 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 we take it to the bank. We send people to jail bur burst on it. Um, you know, we lock folk up best based on the, the witness of men. Um, but if, so if we believe the witness of men, then the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. So now listen, if you believe what men say, and we do, somebody says, hey, your house on fire. You run out looking for the fire. Somebody says, yeah, you got a flat tire. You go looking for the flat tire. We believe the witness of men. We believe what people say. People tell us, oh, stuff is on sale. I got this. We believe them. So if you believe the witness of men, and guess what? And the witness of men is not always true because people get on a witness stand and lie. Even in court, they get in court. Oh, swear to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yeah, and they get right there and lie. But we believe it. And if it's constricted enough or, uh, you know, whatever, if they're convincing enough, we believe. It. So we believe the witness of men. So he, John says, if you believe the witness of men, then the witness of God is far far greater. So the witness of God is greater. So in other words, even if you believe some of the witnesses of men, and you have some, nah, I kind of doubt whether that really happened with men, then we don't have that, and when it comes to God, we believe that God said. So here is the witness of God, and here is the witness that God has given regarding his son. Here is what God the Father said about God the Son. Okay, Here's what God the Father said about Jesus Christ. This is God's testimony. Okay? He says uh, regarding his son, he has testified of his son, he who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself. Okay? He who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself. Well, who's the witness? Where's the witness? Well, we just gave you some witnesses. We got those that are bearing witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. They're bearing witness in heaven. We've got those that are bearing the witness on earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. So we've got the witness in yourself. Okay? So the witness is in you. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. There's John calling folk a liar again. I don't know what it is, but John was telling people that you a liar. But he says it again. If you if you don't believe, he who believes that um, the Son of God has witness in himself, but he who does not believe, you don't believe God, you've made God a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. So in other words, if you don't believe what God says, then basically you're saying to God, God, you are a liar. You are lying about your Son. Okay, I don't want to be in your shoes or in your house or next to you if you start making those kind of professions. But that's what John says. You are a liar. Uh, you're trying to make God a liar. But the reality is you are a liar. Okay. So um, you, you made God a liar. Basically, you said God, God was lying in terms of what he said about his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Ah, hold on, wait a minute. Here's God's testimony that you have eternal life. I love this because now I don't have to believe what the preacher said. I don't have to believe what the lady down the street said, the person on the corner said. I don't have to believe the witness of these other people, okay? I don't care how long they've been in business. I don't care what their denomination is. I don't care what kind of church they have. It does not matter. I'm going to hook up with the testimony of God regarding this subject matter. I, if I want to know, hey, do I have eternal life? Okay, do I have eternal life? That's the question a lot of people have. Do I have eternal life? Well, here is God's testimony regarding eternal life. And this, wow, this opens doors for people. This ought to help people a lot to affirm them in their, their Christianity. Okay, he who has the son I'm going to let me back up. This is a testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Okay? 
Here's God's testimony. Here's the one, what God has said about giving us eternal life and he has said about that eternal life being in his son. Verse 12, he who has the son has life. This is God's testimony about eternal life. He who has the son has life. Now, we're not switching in the middle of the subject, the middle of the sentence to talk about some kind of temporary life. He said, this is a testimony about eternal life. He who has the son has eternal life. So here lies the question, do I have the son? If I have the son, I have eternal life. Okay, now here's another question that people have. How long does that eternal life last? Well, how long does eternal last? Uh, okay, I'll wait for you. I'll wait. I'm waiting. Yeah, it's forever. It's eternal. This is God's testimony about his son that, his, that in his son there is life. And this is God's testimony about eternal life, whether or not you have it. If you have the son, you have life. If you have accepted the son, that is Jesus the Christ, who is the son of God, you've testified he is the son of God. If you have him, you've received him, you have fellowship with him, guess what? Here's God's testimony. Eternal life is in his son, and now you have life. Here it is. He who has a son has life. But here you go. Let me back up. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. If I have not accepted, I do not have the son of God. I do not have life. I can't be running around here, and this makes it real clear, guys. I can't be running around talking about I have God and I've got eternal life because I have God. No, this text makes it clear. I need to have the son if I'm going to have eternal life. I've got to have him because the life is in him. This eternal life is in the son. And the only way I can get that eternal life, I have to have the son. Okay? I got to have the, the S-O-N. I've got to have the son of God because eternal life is in him. If I have the son, I have life. If I do not have the son of God, I do not have life. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how nice you are. I don't care how upright you are. I don't care how many times you go to church or go to your organization or meetings or whatever it is you do. I don't care. Any of that, none of that really matters. If you don't have the son of God, you do not have eternal life. Now, remember what I said. It wasn't just life. It's eternal life because that's the context of the passage. It is eternal life. How do I know I have eternal life? I know I have eternal life because I have the son. How did I get the son? I got the son by faith. It was in the earlier passage and he's laying this out for us. So it's inexcusable. It's, it's undeniable. We, we can clearly, clearly walk away from the teachings here and know with a great degree of confidence and certainty that I have everlasting life. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. Some of you are thinking, no, oh, well, that's not the way I heard it taught. That's not the way I heard. Well, here's the Bible. The Bible is speaking. I don't care what other people say it. The Bible is speaking. If you have the son, you have life. If you do not have the son, you do not have life. Okay? It's, that's pretty clear, pretty simple. All right? So there you have it. Um, verse 13. He says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why? I wrote, written to you, this specific group, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe. Keep on believing. I wrote to you so you may believe in the name of the Son of God, that you might understand that in the, that name, what power is in that name, what, what is possessed in that name, that eternal life is in him. It's in that name, Jesus, who is the Christ. All right? So he says, look, I've written all this to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. So the, what John is doing is he's removing all question, all suspicion that we might not have it, okay? So for anyone who is not sure, as you walk through this and read through this, this is all the proof points. I got this, I got that, check, 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 check. I know I have eternal life, check, 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 check. It, it alleviates all the questions. And I understand that this life is eternal, okay? And you don't have to go through a whole bunch of deep, heavy stuff just look up what eternal means. It's forever. 
if I get this life today and I can lose it tomorrow, it is not eternal. If I get it today and I can lose it tomorrow or it can be washed away tomorrow, it is temporary life. So it's temporal. It's only as good as you keeping it. But the good news is that's not true because it's not yours to keep. It's his to keep and his to give. And he gave it to you by grace. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right? So it's eternal. It's forever. It's secure. It's given by God. He wrote to let us know. This is the testimony of God. What he said and what he's given about his son. All right? Verse 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. Okay? Because he just now told us, um, you know, I've written these things that you may believe in the name of the Son of God and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, rather. All right, now, not only do we have this belief, we've got some confidence that comes along with our belief. I'm, I'm now confident. I, I've got great confidence. And, and what, what confidence is that, Pastor? You know, now, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Y'all see that? And if, I, it, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have put the petition that we have asked of him. All right, here we go. Let's unpack this real quickly. I'm, I'm going to unpack this. So, first of all, here's the confidence that the believer has, okay? Now, now that I know I'm a child of God, I line up with the, the proof points of the text. I line up with the testimony of God that he gave about his son, that life is in his son. If you have the son, you have life. I know I have life and I've got eternal life, but that's not the end. It's not just enough. He doesn't just say, leave you with that. Say, hey, it's good news. You got eternal life. But he also goes a step further. and He says, but here's the confidence that we have. Those of us who are sons and daughters of God, you can have confidence that, listen, whatever we ask according to his will. Now, the most important phrase there is according to his will. Because most people want to say, they all skip the according to his will part, and they say, whatever you ask of God, he's going to give it to you. That's not true, okay? But whatever you ask of God according to his will, he will provide because if it is the will of God, God wills it to be, okay? That means God is willing. God has put it in play. God has it for you. So if we pray, and this is one of the issues about our prayer life, we need to learn how to pray in the will of God. All right? And again, not just, not just casually saying, you know, let thy will be done, but literally meaning if it is his will, because sometimes even in our prayer life, we're not sure about his will, but we want to pray. And I'd say even ask some, Lord, teach me to pray in your will. I want to ask for the things that you want for me. Okay. I want to be praying according to your will. But what John says here, if we, if yeah, for verse 14, then here's our confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's the first part, because for some people we lose heart thinking God does not hear us. But the important thing you've got to know is that he hears you. I don't care even if you've been praying this prayer for 20 years. He hears you, okay? You're not abandoned. You're not alone. He hears you. God hears you. He hears your prayer. When you're praying according to his will, he hears you, okay? I'll try to get you there. He hears you. He hears your prayer as you pray according to his will. But that's not the end of it. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, again, according to his will, we know that we will have the petition that we have asked of him. We know, this is confident, we have confidence, we know that we will have what we ask of him. Now, here's where I'm going to try to help somebody out because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I'm going to start praying for this or that tonight, tomorrow, um, and I'm going to pray in his will, and I know this is his will for me. But watch this. What the text does not tell me is the timetable of God's accomplishment of his will. I know. But here, wow. Whew, let me, I'm, I'm going to try to help somebody here, right here. 
I know that if I pray in his will, and if it is his will, I know he hears me, but I also know that he's going to answer and provide for me what was in his will to give me, watch this, even though I don't know when it will happen because I have confidence in it, it gives me calm and peace to wait on it. I can wait on something knowing I can wait on something with peace when I know that my father is going to give it to me. Now, I might not know when, but I know I'm going to get it. Okay? I know I'm going to get what I've asked because I asked according to his will. Now, that is, if I know that I'm praying according to his will, he will give it to me. And this is really key. So, when we jump around this text and only grab, grab out parts of it that want, we want to make suitable yeah, we know God hears us. He's going to answer our prayer. Well, wait a minute. Uh, whatever you ask of God, he's going to give it to you. Oh, wait a minute. It has to be according to his will because God will not hold back his will from blessing you with what is his will to provide for you, especially when you ask him. Y'all still here? And so he, he wants to provide it. And then you ask, he'll provide it. And so you can, you can rest. You can stop worrying about it. I know God's going to provide it. When is it going to happen? I need it right now. No, you don't need it right now. You want it right now, okay? There's a difference between needing it right now and wanting it right now. But I can have peace. I can have confidence knowing that it's coming. And guess what? Now I can focus on other things. Instead of me worrying about this thing, I can focus on other things. But because I know that it's coming, I know that God is going to do this. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this is just going to be a walk in the park, easy, everyday type of thing. Sometimes it's just going to be looking back and say, oh, sure, I wish it would come today. You know, it's like a package from Amazon or, you know, you order stuff in the mail, you're like, oh, I wish it would come today. You Sometimes you don't know when it's coming. You know, you, you go on the, on, online and look for the tracker. What is the tracker saying? Tracker says, well, it's coming. You know, some some vendors will say, we got your order. It's coming. And they don't tell you nothing else. And you're like, well, when is it coming? And we get all anxious depending on what it is and how bad you need it. you like, really, ooh, Lord, when is it coming? When is it coming? Well, I don't know, but I know it's coming. Now, with God, we know he hears, and we know if it's his will, he wants it for us. With, well, with some of these Amazon and these other places we, we order stuff, I don't necessarily know that it is their will to get it to me, okay? And so sometimes you might have to call somebody up and be like, hey, I ordered this joint like two months ago. When is it coming? You know, uh, things like that. So nevertheless, but we know we, we can have confidence. We have comfort. We got peace of mind to know that if I have prayed in the will of God, he will answer it. He will provide it. I can rest. I can be at peace and I can move on. Go to the next thing. Go wait. Uh, I can comfortably and passionately wait for it to come because I know it's coming because I've asked and prayed it in his will. All right. So um, if anyone sees his brother, Sinning a sin which does not lead to death. He, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin leading to death. Now, this is another part of the very uh, complicated passages passed in this particular chapter. So let me slowly go through this one more time. So if anyone sees his brother sinning, so you see your brother sinning, in uh, sinning a sin which does not lead to death. Notice the emphasis. It does not lead to death. Does not lead to death. He will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that uh, he should pray about that. Um, all unrighteousness is sin. Okay? So, we, we, and we know the unrighteousness, which is sin, is wages of sin is death. So now, what are we talking about? Sin that leads to death. The one way of leading into this is that sin that leads to immediate death. Okay? So there's, there's certain sins, and maybe some you maybe can think of, that will probably lead to immediate death. But oftentimes, we truthfully really don't know what sins are going to lead to an immediate death um, as a result of our doing them, okay? Sometimes you don't know because you get one person that does it, they live for a long time. The next person does it, boom, they're gone. 
So we really don't always know it's, you know, it, but but if it, it's, it's up to God. Um, and so, but the important thing here is that his emphasis is a sin that doesn't lead to death. Because a, a lot of times our question, well, what is the sin that leads to death? Because we try to figure out what do I not do? What, what sins can I do and get away with? <laughs> That's really what our question is. Um, but again, these are more focused on just like immediate sins. But he comes back to say, because what he's not trying to convey here, he's not trying to convey that there are some sins you can do and get away with. That's why he comes back to say all sin is unrighteousness, okay? Or all unrighteousness is sin, okay? So anything that we do wrong is sin. But there are some sins that may cause some immediate results from God, death, and there are other sins that, you know, maybe maybe God bears with us longer in before we ultimately die, okay? Um, so if anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, uh, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. So we ask God about it. He gives life to those who are not sinning leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that you should pray about it. In other words, only looking at, only looking for that. Don't look for the sin that's leading to death. What John is basically saying. Now, some would argue that this also the issue of sin leading to death is the unforgivable sin type of approach. That we may look at, blah, 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 blah. But what his focus is, look, this is a sin that's not leading to death. And, um, you know, ultimately understand that all, sin, all unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin that leads to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. So there is the, the answer to part of people's question. Well, what, what, is it like, what does it need to know so like, I don't do it? Well, if I'm born again in the context of this, we don't sin. We don't practice these sins that would lead unto death. That's not part of our practice because we're not we're not practicing sinners as believers. Okay, we're we're forgiven sinners. We're not practicing sinners as believers. We're we're forgiven sinners. The unbelievers are practicing sinners. So that's why he says, um, "We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. That is, does not practice sin. We don't have a lifestyle of practice of sin. But he who has been born of God keeps." himself and the wicked one does not touch him okay so because of our relation with god we we're 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 being kept god keeps himself uh, the one who was born of god rather keeps himself and that is we are kept from the the lifestyle or patterns of the of you know the, the wicked one and so therefore the wicked one does not touch us all right we know that we are of god and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. All right? So again, here we go. We know we are a God. You give me all these reasons why we know, how you are sure, how you are firm, how you are secure in the fact that you are a God. So now we know. He says, look, we know we are of God. But at the same time, don't be foolish to think that just because you're of God and just because you are a Christian or just because you've got a family full of Christians or just because you go to a church full of Christians, that somehow the world is going to change and somehow the world is going to be wonderful just because you're a Christian. No, the reality is we are children born of God, guaranteed eternal life, but we also know that this world that we live in is under the sway, under the control, under the influence of the wicked one. <sighs> so don't think that somehow our Christianity insulates us. It may insulate you from the practice of sin, it may insulate you from the condemnation that is to come. So we got all these insulations that our relationship with Christ protects us from. And this is good news. We got a lot of insulations, okay? We're protected from the judgment that's come. That's why we can have we have confidence in that we have protection from uh, eternal death and destruction because of our relationship with God. We've got all kinds of insulations. So we're insulated from all those things, but we're in the world. And we're not, watch this, we're in the world and we're not insulated from the idea or the reality that the, the evil one, the wicked one, is controlling the world that we live in, okay? He has, a, he has a, a limited control given by God in the world that we live in, okay? So that's a reality, 
Guess what? That's the reason why, even though you're born again, you're a child of God and you're washing the blood of the crucified one, running for your life, saved with fire, baptized, all that good stuff. Guess what? You still got to deal with sin every day. You still got to deal with struggles every day. You still got to deal with the wickedness of this world every day. We still got to deal with things that are unjust, unfair, unrighteous, not right, incorrect, blah, blah, blah. We still got to deal with that. We still got to see things happen that shouldn't happen. I mean, it's, it's part of the sway of the wicked one. <sighs> and, and, you know, I was, I was, um, well, where was I? Hmm. I think I was coming home, I think. I think I got home or something today. Um, or just as I was getting home, I noticed something on my phone and said, you know, talk about Bill Cosby being released from prison. And I was reading a little bit of the article and all that. And, and, and then I was, I realized, and, and I realized that, you know, he had been convicted and got put through this whole jury trial process Although he had a, an agreement, um, a prior agreement already in place that if he had testified in this other civil case, that they would not prosecute him criminally in the future. So they, 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 they got, he signs all that, 2005, somewhere around here or something. And then they come up with these, you know, things, you know, later, 15, whatever years later, 13 years, whatever the time frame was. They come up with this all this later, and then they ignore the fact that we you, he signed this agreement. They prosecute him. They send him to jail virtually based on 40-year-old testimonies of things that happen. And then he goes to jail, and then they release him today and say, this will right his life? Wait a minute, time out. Do y'all know what happened to this dude when, when he, he got prosecuted and he got convicted and he got put in jail? I mean, two years of his life, first of all, in jail, or however long it was he was in jail, lost all his, uh, you know, his uh, promotions and all the other stuff that he, you know, he was, you know, had, all his deals, all that stuff that he had, scandalized his name, mocked him, you know, whatever, whatever. And so now you're saying, okay, oh, sorry, I'm bad. You can come home now, You're 83 years old, you, you, sorry about that, and you, you, I just made you whole? That's not making me, that's unjust. That's unfair. Now, regardless of what you think about whatever he did back in the day or whatever the testimonies are, none of us were there, so none of us can say what really happened. I don't even know. All I know, if I made a deal with you that you're not going to prosecute me, you shouldn't be able to come back and prosecute me when we had a deal. I mean, and it was, you know, it's all in the court system and it's all laid out. So it's not just. It's like you and I accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, reading this text tonight, having the guarantee of the testimony of God that says we have eternal life, getting to heaven and God saying, you know what, I really don't like the way you look, so you ain't getting eternal life. Or, you know, pulling the rug out under the deal that we had. We had a deal. I got to deal with you, God. If I have repented my sin and placed my faith in you, you're going to give me your son to dwell in me, to, to, to control my life, to, to shelter me from the judgment that is yet to come. And I, if I get to heaven and then all of a sudden you go, no, 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 I'm sorry, my bad. We, we kind of changed the rules. And now you got to go through this just, you got to go through this judgment based on your sin. Well, that's not fair. That's not just. And so what I'm, I'm grateful that God doesn't change. He's immutable. He's unchangeable. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't change his ways. And so things he's promised us that he said he's going to do, he's going to do. But we have to be realistic. We've got to understand. We've got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that as much as we are saved, as much as we are born again, as much as we have eternal life, as much as we know that we know that we know that Jesus lives in us, we also cannot forget that we as children of God are still living in a world that is sinful, that is wicked and controlled by the wicked one. And if the wicked one is controlling the world, you're going to see, listen to me, you're going to see some injustices, some injustices that are executed upon people unfairly. You're going to see some injustices of people being released unfairly. You're going to see some injustices of of all kinds and all sorts because of the wicked one. That's who is, has the sway and the control of this world that we live in. But thanks be to God that we have a hope that is greater than the hope of this world. 
because my hope is, is built on the promises of God that assured me and affirmed to me that if I have accepted him, if I've got the son, I've got eternal life. And so guess what? I'm not sitting around every day worrying about whether or not I have eternal life. I got a guarantee. I got a promise from God. I'm secure in that. I'm comfortable in that. that and I know that if I've asked of him anything, and I've asked of him eternal life, and he's provided. He heard me, and he provided it. I can be at peace. I can be at rest. Even though I'm dealing with all the headaches of this wicked world, I'm dealing with all the issues of the wicked one, I know this is not my home, so I'm not going to get too depressed about this thing, okay? I'm just going to realize that, you know what? I'm going to be, I'm going home somehow. I'm going home sometime. I'm going to be at home after a while, okay? I just like, I was, I was out of town yesterday, and we was coming back uh, from from our trip, and, and I got to the airport. It was supposed to be there, you know, a couple hours before time. We was there in plenty of time, and our flight was supposed to leave at 9 o'clock. And then uh, we got the we got the uh, text message that said, you're up. It's not going to be 9 o'clock. It's going to be 9, 9.45. Like, okay, 9.45. Get to the airport. I still got plenty of time, blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting there waiting on my 9.45. Oh, sorry, it's going to be 10 o'clock. Okay, but guess what? In my mind, I'm like, you know what? I'm at the airport. I got I got my ticket. <laughs> I got my boarding pass in my hand. I'm I'm going home. Okay, y'all hearing what I'm saying? And then later on, they came back across again. They said ten fifteen. They said, well, you know what? The plane is coming. You know, it was like maybe coming up towards the time where the plane's supposed to be departing. And they said, well, the plane is coming. We got to get the other people off the plane. We got to sanitize the plane. Then we're gonna start boarding the plane, and we'll get we'll get y'all out of here as soon as we can. So now. Now it was as soon as we can. At first it was 9.45, then it was 10, then it was 10.15, then it was whatever time. Then it was as soon as we can. But guess what? In my mind, I wasn't stressing. I wasn't stressing about the fact that it was getting late. I wasn't stressing about the fact that I wasn't comfortable sitting in the airport all that time. I wasn't stressed about that. You know what was on my mind? You know what gave me comfort and gave me peace? I'm going home. Amen. I'm trying to talk to somebody right about here. I'm not stressing about what's going on in this world. I ain't going to let this thing get me all bent out of shape because I'm going home. It might not be today, might not be tomorrow. Matter of fact, it might be delayed, okay? But it might, even though it's delayed, it's not going to be denied. I know I'm going home, amen. And I'm going, I'm going to make it because I have a, a guarantee from the word of God himself that if I have his son, I have eternal life and I'm going home to be with him. And so whatever I got to go through down here, I'm going to go through it. And I trust me, I don't all, I, mean, I, I don't have no, I don't have no walk tiptoe through the tulips life. I got stuff that goes on in my life too, just like everybody else. You know, I know a lot of times pastors, the people think pastors, oh, he ain't got no problems, he ain't got no troubles, he ain't got no struggles. Oh, we got, we got issues in our families and our lives and all that too, just like y'all do. And so guess what? But I ain't going to let it stress me out. I ain't going to let it worry me. I'm gonna, I got to press on. I got do, I'm going to do what I got to do. Until he comes home, to, comes to take me home. And that's what each and every one of us needs to do. Do what we are here to do until the Lord comes to take us home. And we ain't here for permanent. We ain't here forever. We are going home. Our flight might be del delayed, but it's not denied. And we have a guarantee from God that he's going to come and get us and take us home. And that's ultimately what John lays out here. He wants us to know. Yes. The world's under the sway of the wicked one. I got that. I'm good. I'm good with that. Listen to how he, he closes all this out. He says, look, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him. Isn't that good? The, 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 the Lord God, he came so we can have an understanding and that we may know him, that we may understand cognitively and experientially, that we may know him who is true. And that we are in him who is true and his son, Jesus Christ. So here it is. We get to know him. We are in him who is true. All of it is true because God is true. And in his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God the e and eternal life. Who is, who is the true God? Right there. Jesus Christ, the son. The true God. And eternal life. Where is eternal life? Jesus Christ. Who's the true God? Jesus Christ. What's the promise to us? We're in him. He's in us. He's the true. He's in the true. We're in the true. Who is true? In his son, Jesus the Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. 
odd, odd, odd kind of ending. But if you, if you look at the full context of what he was saying, full context from chapter one all the way through chapter five, what was he saying? He was saying, look, you got to understand there's joy in the fellowship of God. So he closes by letting, he gives us closing warning. The, the joy is in the fellowship of God. The joy is in knowing Jesus and being in fellowship with him, who is the true God. That's where the joy is. But watch this. Keep yourselves from idols. Don't be drawn away to idols. Test the spirit. See if they are of God, that you make sure you are in fellowship with the right, true God. Okay? Stay away. Keep yourselves from idols. That's false gods. Pseudo spirits, those that are not the true and living God who begot you and who begot me and who begot his son, his only begotten son, for our benefit that all of our sin might be washed away, that we might be redeemed and declared the children of God. Don't abandon that for false gods who cannot give you any of those guarantees nor any of those truths because all of them, as opposed to Jesus Christ, who is the true God, all of them are the false gods. All of them are of the Antichrist who has a swaying control on this world. This is good right here. And knowing that he has a swaying control on this world, he's going to send deceptive spirits to sway you to the wickedness of this world, to sway you to believe that doing evil is okay and that you're somehow going to get away with it. Got to pay attention. So he says, stay away from idols, little children. Stay away from idols. And now idols can be people, but idols could also be items. Stay away from things, people, that you invest your efforts, your energy, your love, your dedication to that are not God himself. Stay away from idols. Don't make your house your God. Don't make your car your God. Don't make your children your God. Don't make some huru kuru your God. Stay away from idols, he says, the closing warning. But it's really in great line with all that he has said and all that he's been talking about. This whole thing is about the fellowship from chapters 2 through 5. It's, it's about the, it's about the, um, the fellowship. Um, it's about the behavior of your fellowship. Uh, remember, start off with the basis of our fellowship. It's in Christ. All, all of this is about Christ. We got into this thing through Christ. But our behavior of our fellowship is laying it all out. Staying away from idols is a behavior of fellowship with God. And he encourages you, behave like this. Stay away from idols. Amen, 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 amen. All right, that's my Bible study for tonight. That concludes 1 John chapter 5 and 1 John as an entire book. As I said earlier, uh, we have finished 1 John. It is the last Wednesday of June. We will have no Wednesday night Bible study through the month of July. Sorry about that. You guys can continue to study, uh, continue to read your Bibles. I highly, highly encourage that. Um, and so you, you have great opportunities to keep on studying. Uh, we just won't have a formal Bible study on Wednesday night. There, I believe, will be Noonday for those that um, tune into Noonday Bible Studies on Wednesday. Um, you can still tune into those by contacting Pastor Williams. He'll give you uh, the link if you want to do that. Uh, to connect with him on Wednesdays at noon uh, throughout the month of July. Uh, but for the month of July, no Wednesday night Bible study, no Friday night chats during the month of, of July. Um, I wish I could say I was taking vacation and I was going to be laying and basking in the sun all summer, but I'm not. I'm going to be working. Um, but I got other other things that are going on, other uh, works I got to be doing. So it's just easier uh, for the month not to try to overdo it. So, um, again, um, thank you all for hanging out tonight. Um, looking forward with great expectation to what the Lord is going to do. We are moving up up on our holiday weekend. The 4th of July is going to be on Sunday. Woohoo! 
And uh, as I always do like to give a warning, for those of you who are not uh, astute on the uh, barbecue grill, uh, hello, leave it alone, okay? Don't, I don't want y'all burning down nothing, okay? Don't burn down nothing, uh, you know, let somebody help you, teach you, show you what you got to do um, so you can get it right. Don't barbecue on the on the deck, okay, please. Every year somebody's deck burns down because the embers and stuff get caught, you know, get blown around and they didn't put the whole fire out. And the embers kind of catch the deck in the middle of the night. They wake up in the middle of the night, hold back of the house on fire. Please, 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 don't 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 barbecue <laughs> don't barbecue in the garage um, because the carbon monoxide that comes out from the coals and all that stuff is just gonna go all up in your house and that's not the place. Don't barbecue in the garage. Pull that thing out away from, you know, and barbecue. I'm just trying to help us. And don't overeat, okay? P please, praise the Lord. You know there are certain things that the doctor already told you you're not supposed to be eating. Uh, praise the Lord, somebody. So stay away from overeating. I will say, you know, test a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, moderation is the key, okay? And over a number of days, okay? Don't try to eat the whole apple pie on one day and the whole rack of ribs and the whole pan of chicken, Moderation, just moderation. Because guess what? Happens all the time. I know y'all think I just only be kidding. I'm really, really serious. Because a lot of people end up in the hospital. They're going to end up in the hospital Sunday night or Monday because they ate what they weren't supposed to eat. They overdid it. Then uh, in the hospital, you had a heart attack, stroke, or something like that. So I'm trying to keep you alive, okay? I know you're trying to hurry up and get home to be with the Lord. Uh, but if you're not trying to really quickly get there by eating yourself to death, <laughs> moderation, moderation, moderation. So be safe. Guys, have fun. If those of you who are traveling, praying for your safe travel, that you have an enjoyable time uh, with family, friends, or wherever you may be going. Be safe. Please, please, please be safe. For those of you who are not vaccinated, please consider getting your vaccinations um, because, you know, it's just uh, getting highly risky for those who are not vaccinated with these new variants and all that kind of thing. Uh, and hey, uh, all of the, you know, the, all, yeah. Get vaccinated, you know, so we can move this whole thing along. Um, and, of course, um, you know, keep your mask on, all that stuff, be in compliance, all that. Hey, and for those of you who are traveling, this is your first time traveling um, since the uh, uh, COVID and all that, I'm just giving you all some informational stuff. I've already traveled a couple of times since since that. Um, but, hey, you gonna, you got to keep that mask on in, on the, air, in the airport and on the planes. Uh, I believe there's like a $16,000 fine if you interrupt the, anything with the airline stewardess, you don't want to be paying that, okay? Behave yourself, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, be safe. We want you guys to come back all in one piece and be able to enjoy the holiday. Hey, and it's not too late. Get vaccinated today. You'll be straight by Sunday, all right? So at least round one, you have to get your vaccination, you'll be ready. But nevertheless, um, have a great, great time. I um, look forward to seeing you guys on Sunday morning at um, either 8 o'clock service or a Eight o'clock in person, 11 o'clock uh, by a live stream. All right, let's look to the Lord in prayer as we close out for tonight. Um, Father in heaven, we honor and bless you and thank you for everything that you've done, all that you're doing right now. You are grateful. We are grateful for you, Lord, for your word. It's just so powerful. Thank you for the promises. Thank you for the guarantees we have. Thank you for our, your son, Jesus Christ, uh, in whom there is life and that being eternal life. That if we have him, we have eternal life. And uh, we can also speak to those who do not have him, that they may know you don't have eternal life. It's not based on their actions, their deeds, or their associations or affiliations, but the only on their fellowship with you. And if they, they can't have fellowship with you without having fellowship with the Son. So, Father God, I thank you today and this evening for all that has transpired. I thank you for my brothers and my sisters who are tuned in. I pray for their well-being. I pray for their safety. I pray for their children and their families. I pray for the health and the well-being. I pray for the mental health, Heavenly Father, and their well-being. I pray, God, for their grief that they may be enduring and going through. I'm praying, Lord God, that you would lift them up and strengthen them and allow them to see your glory. Allow them to see your your, your, your benefits towards them, Lord God, and how much you love them. And I pray, God, it causes them to break out in a, 
and an exciting and enthusiastic worship of you, even wherever they may be, because you have been so, so good to us, Lord. So I just bless you, Lord God, for this evening's Bible study, for the study of the word that you allowed us to enjoy. And I just pray you continue to keep us, Lord, in the sense of your holy and divine will. To him who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the eternal and everlasting wise God. To him be glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forever. All the people of God together said amen, amen, and amen. All right, bless y'all. Thanks for hanging out with me. Love you all as usual and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Bye-bye.